What are the different manifestations of hyperparathyroidism? How can hyperparathyroidism present in different ways? I'm Dr. Bob Akhler, I'm from Center for Advanced Parathyroid Surgery. Let's talk about the parathyroid function first. Normal parathyroids uh, have a setting for calcium, so each individual is genetically set for a certain number. This particular patient is set for a calcium of 9.0. So when this person's calcium goes from 9.0 to 8.9, the PTH levels rise. That increased PTH level goes to the bones and tells the bone to release calcium into the bloodstream. It goes to the kidneys and tells the kidneys to reabsorb the calcium from the urine. It activates vitamin D in the kidneys that now go to the intestines and increase the absorption of calcium from 20% to 80%. All of these three mechanisms increase the level of calcium in your bloodstream. Now, if your calcium level overshoots and goes from 9.0 to 9.1, then there is a decrease in PTH level that allows you to filter the excess calcium out. That's how the parathyroid glands keep a tight control on the calcium levels. And this graph here shows the curve of how calcium and PTH respond to each other. When someone develops hyperparathyroidism, that's because they get a mutation in one of the mechanisms in the parathyroid gland that controls the calcium or senses the calcium. And so if the mutation occurs, that particular cell now has a higher calcium level than 9.0. The normals have 9.0, and this one is now set for 11, let's say. Now, as the calcium level arises, the PTH production goes low, but then the abnormal parathyroid cell that was aiming for 11 doesn't realize it's making a mistake. It keeps trying to produce PTH to bring the calcium all the way up to 11, right? And it will do it indefinitely because it doesn't realize it's making a mistake until it finally turns into a tumor that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time, right? So hyperparathyroidism can uh, show up in the cl classical sense when calcium is elevated, PTH is elevated, and people have multitude of symptoms, right? It can present with calcium and PTH elevation without symptoms, right? We call that asymptomatic. Now, without symptoms is kind of confusing, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Some patients have normal calcium levels, but elevated PTH levels. Some people will have calcium levels that are high and normal PTH levels. And I'll go through the description of all these different mechanisms and how they occur, okay? But all of them are hyperparathyroidism and all of them can cause symptoms, osteoporosis, kidney stones, and all sorts of problems. Asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism. When they say someone is asymptomatic, that doesn't mean they don't have any of the myriad of symptoms that someone can get with hyperparathyroidism. They mean that they haven't had fractures of their bones, they don't have osteoporosis on scan, they haven't passed kidney stones, and they ha don't have kidney stones uh, that they know of, right? So this is an example. A 51-year-old woman who is menopausal complains of fatigue, memory loss, increased anxiety, body aches, states, I feel old, which is really a common statement from people who are suffering from hyperparathyroidism. They feel like they just got old all of a sudden. This person hasn't been able to work in two years, right? Her calcium is slightly elevated at 10.4, just a little bit above the 10.2. PTH is also slightly elevated above the upper limit of normal of 65. Hers is at 75. Her vitamin D happens to be in the normal range, low normal range. And bone density doesn't show osteoporosis, shows osteopenia, right? This is an asymptomatic patient, even though she's devastated by the symptoms that she has. She says she feels old and she can't work. Based on the guidelines and definitions, she's considered to be asymptomatic, but she doesn't have fractures of her bones, and she hasn't passed kidney stones, and she doesn't have osteoporosis on her bone density. So in these particular set of patients, I really advise them that they, their quality of life should guide their decision, right? Because that's the most important thing. The quality of our existence is, is the most important thing. And if this disease is giving you multiple symptoms that are affecting how you exist, then you, can, you should address it. You should get a scan, find which parathyroid gland is abnormal. And then based on that, you can see how easy your surgery can be and decide if you want to take the next step. But it really it depends on how you feel and how much this is impacting your existence, all right? The next group is normal calcemic patients, right? Patients who have normal calcium levels, they check the routine labs, they get normal calcium levels, 
they start to develop symptoms and are oftentimes ignored, mostly ignored because most of these patients, most people who are affected by hyperparathyroidism are women in their middle ages. So they are going through perimenopausal changes. They're told that they're going through midlife hormonal changes sometimes, they're boxed into these categories, that they may have anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, all things that are not necessarily addressable or curable, right? But they may actually have normal calcium and hyperparathyroidism. So uh, let me show you an example. This is in a 40 year or old man uh, suffering from low impact risk factor. So he just put his hand on, on the table a little firmly and then developed some fractures. He's been, he's been having depression, high blood pressure, constipation, and body aches, none of which was really diagnosed. Calciums have always been normal, but because he had the low impact risk factor, they did a bone density study, which showed that he has osteoporosis, which is uncommon in a 48 year old man. Um, then, then when I checked the PTH level, which was elevated, so calcium was normal, PTH was elevated. In this setting, what I do is I repeat the blood test to confirm this relationship of calcium being normal and PTH being elevated, right? I do it fasting at eight o'clock in the morning, so I have consistent numbers without interference from any other factors during the day. And in his case, when I repeated the labs on the second and third date, and I do it twice more usually, I again got calcium levels that are in the normal range and PTH levels that were elevated, right? And one of the times that vitamin D was low and I supplemented vitamin D and that didn't rectify the problem. He still had elevations in PTH levels, right? So when you have someone who has PTH levels that are elevated in normal calciums, you have to look at all the other potential causes of a high PTH, which this is a pretty, pretty good list of it. This table here, vitamin D deficiency, easy to correct with vitamin D. We did it, it did correct this patient's issue. Low calcium intake, when you take a 24-hour and urine calcium, that'll be low, right? So if someone has malabsorption and they're not absorbing the calcium or vitamin D or, or other issues where they're not intaking enough calcium, right? Easy to correct if their calcium intake is low with supplementation. If magnesium low is low, that it can present in the same way. There's a condition called renal calcium leak where these patients have a lot of calcium leaking out of their urine, right? So that the blood level of calcium keeps lowering because the kidney is filtering excess extra calcium out of it when it shouldn't be. And in response to that, PTH levels go up to try to bring the calcium level in the bloodstream. And there's a diuretic hydrochlorothiazide that can easily treat that. Kidney dysfunction, which causes uh, filtration issues as well as vitamin D issues. Um, and then some medications and they're some of the older patients have vitamin D, active vitamin D issues, either forming active vitamin D or responding in their intestines to vitamin D, in which case supplementation with activated vitamin D can help, right? So you need to do a thorough workup. So you don't know what their starting point is. You don't know if they're starting at 9.2 and going to 9.5 or whether they started from 8.5 and went to 9.5, but Let's compare those two scenarios. If someone has a normal calcium of 9.5 and they go to 1.5, one unit change, versus a person who starts at 8.5 and goes to 9.5, that's also a one unit measure of change, right? Probably requiring the same level of PTH interaction to get you there, right? This is the same disease, right? The same magnitude of change for the body to handle. The problem we have with normal calcemic patients is that we don't know the starting point, so we can't say how severe the disease is, okay? And that's when we have to depend on the patient. We have to look at all the symptoms they're having, how long have they been having it, look at all the other parameters, kidney function, get CT scans to see if there is any stones in the kidneys, look at the bone density, compare their quality of life, listen to the patient. They'll tell you if they feel like all of a sudden three years ago, life became more challenging, even though their marriage is great, their kids are healthy, their family is healthy, no trauma has happened in their life, but all of a sudden their body just kind of gave up on them and got older, right? And you have to listen to the patient and act based on that, right? Sometimes you're lucky enough where the patient has old calcium levels, right? So they may have you know, had a pregnancy 20 years ago, 30 years ago, during that time, their gynecologist may have ordered some calcium levels. 
if you look at a couple of calcium levels for this person and you see that their calcium was hang hovering around the low eights and now they're in the nines, mid nines, then that tells you that the set point was around eight and now they're hovering at a higher number. So that's one way to figure this out. These are all mysteries that you're trying to get data points to figure out the answer. Normal hormonal hypothyroidism. These are patients who have elevated calcium levels, but their PTH levels are in the normal level, right? So this is one such patient, 64 year old woman, complains of fatigue, memory loss, increased anxiety and aches, has had history of kidney stones. They check their calcium levels. Calciums are elevated, not dramatically so. It's 10.9, 10.2 is the upper limit of normal. PTH is 52. Now I would say a PTH of 52 when the range is 15 to 65 is not appropriate. So normally when your calcium level goes up, PTH goes down. When your calcium level goes down, PTH goes up, right? This is the relationship. So if your calcium level is above normal, your PTH should be really low. In his case, in her case, I mean, her PTH is actually in the upper side of normal. So that should already clue you in as to something being abnormal. Now, that could be a red herring. So you want to repeat the labs for this person, right? You want to check again at eight o'clock in the morning and fasting multiple times to see if this inconsistency exists. And in, in her case, it did. Calcium level was 10.5 next time around, PTH 48, upper side of normal. Calcium level rose up a little bit on the third day, 10.7. PTH came down a bit, but didn't really go down far enough. So this is an indication that, that probably there is normal hormonal hyperparathyroidism going on. Now, what does the workup include? Well, you have to rule out all the other known causes of hypercalcemia. And these are all the other known causes of hypercalcemia. So you need to have a doctor, a surgeon that's fully vested in figuring your problems out. Do a thorough investigation to make sure nothing else is causing that elevation in calcium. Once that's done and those are ruled out, then what you have, again, is normal hormonal hyperparathyroidism. You have to do scans and try to figure out what's going on and so on. The incidence of hyperplasia is slightly higher in these patients because their PTHs are lower. PTHs that are less than 100 have a little bit higher incidence of getting hyperplasia, still dominated by a parathyroid adenoma, but hyperplasia. So why do these patients have normal hormonal hyperparathyroidism? Well, their body's more sensitive to parathyroid hormone, to PTH. So you know, you know people who are very sensitive to medications and they take a little bit of Tylenol and they, they don't feel good and so on, and others take three or four and their headache is not even touched, right? We all have different sensitivities. We also are the same way as it relates to PTH and parathyroid. People who have hyperparathyroidism with really high PTHs, when their PTH comes down, they hover average in the higher range of normal, right? People who have normal hormonal hyperparathyroidism, after you do surgery, their PTHs rest in a much lower range. So their range of normal, instead of being 15 to 65, maybe five to 20. So a PTH of 45 may be double the normal for them, okay? So it is, it is a matter of sensitivity. So the range of normal for someone who has hypercalcemic hyperparathyroidism, doesn't have PTH sensitivity, is 15 to 65, right? So 15 to 65, right? For someone who's sensitive to PTH, their range of normal may be five to 25, right? And so the graph looks the same. It's just the, the PTH concentration levels are different and sensitivity, right? Same disease, just the different manifestations of it, right? And this is another way of showing it. This is the normal range for someone who had normal sensitivity to PTH. So 15 to 65, right? And this is the range for someone who's sensitive, 5 to 25, 30, right? And when this person gets a disease, when you get hyperparathyroidism, their set point for calcium goes much higher here, 10.7, right? And their PTH ranges for this graph of the abnormal tumor still doesn't rise up above the, the range of normal, which is 65, right? And they may have normal levels of hormones, but they still have hyperparathyroidism and need to be treated. The good news is whatever the manifestation of hyperparathyroidism, when you do surgery and treat them, 
all those patients will have improvement in their bone density. So no matter whatever your manifestation, whichever way your parathyroid disease presents itself, if you get treatment, successful treatment by an experienced surgeon, then you're able to increase your bone density. And that increased bone density can last years and years later. So in this study from Columbia, it showed that all successfully treated parathyroid patients had bone densities that increased 10% even 15 years later after surgery. So hopefully this helps. If you have any questions, please let us know. If you like this video, please like it. Please subscribe to us so we know what kind of videos you like and we can make more of them for you. Be well.